Hello, traders. It's Friday, July the 14th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly, and I look for what we can expect in the final 24 hours of this trading week. Well, we continue to see the most high profile of event risk or uh, headline uh, fodder lose traction in terms of market impact. This past 24 hours uh, in particular was uh, increasing its focus on the U.S. event risk versus risk trends and political intrigue uh, as those two particular themes were certainly powering down. Uh, but Taking a look at what we could have feasibly or reasonably expected, uh, we, we discussed this going into uh, the trading session Thursday. It was going to be a struggle uh, to motivate the markets, even though we were talking about uh, very prominently uh, Janet Yellen, Fed chairwoman, uh, doing her second day of testimony, this time before the Senate, uh, and a couple of Fed speakers. Uh, I didn't actually see Evan's commentary, but uh, Bernard and Kaplan uh, talking about monetary policy and this was a struggle uh, for a few reasons. But before we talk about why is this is a struggle, this is important to understand because uh, we are going to be moving into some very important monetary policy oriented uh, event risk in the upcoming 24 hours. Uh, but before we uh, discuss why it was a struggle and why it's going to continue to be a struggle, take a look at what the dollar is, is, is sitting on technically. Uh, now, I frequently discuss the 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 trinity of of of, uh, of uh, analysis techniques techniques that I like to watch technical I think most of us are familiar with fundamental pretty common as well uh, but the third is is conditional meaning just generally what is common amongst the entire financial system usually dictated by liquidity and uh, to a certain degree the animal spirits I think it's too frequently wrapped up into another analysis technique, either technicals or fundamentals, and thereby it is reduced in terms of importance. But if we start our analysis from the uh, from the first filter, that conditional uh, aspects uh, to the entire financial system are first taken into account, we can much more readily uh, use those or utilize those technical or fundamental or combined uh, techniques to greater effect. We know when a trend line or zone of support or resistance is going to hold, we know when event risk is going to be more uh, impactful or perhaps overlooked. Um, but with that being said, what are our market conditions? What is the conditional factors that we see most consistently? It's a struggle a genuine struggle to mark a true break and even more difficult to establish follow through momentum or if you will a trend that's true as you can see here of the dollar index the dxy dollar index that is true of the s&p 500 which stands right at its record high just shy of it yet is it making any clear and concerted effort has it made clear and concerted effort uh, really since march it's been a struggle uh, even the really high profile developments that we have recently, like the dollar CAD, which we'll come back to, uh, a very strong break, but this has really come in starts and fits, not really in the overpowering uh, drive that we would expect. And furthermore, uh, it is a break of least resistance, if you will. It moves back into a comfortable range rather than forging uh, new territory. All right, so even when you do have these breaks, they have caveats. So this is kind of the market condition we're dealing with. It's very reticent to make big critical moves. And when you're talking about a increasingly dominant or uh, overt asset, dollar being the most liquid currency and arguably one of the most liquid assets in the world, it in turn is more that much more complicated and uh, difficult to motivate. So we stand at, going up to a monthly chart again, uh, the midpoint of a 30-year range, actually a 31-year range. The high set, ba uh, set back in 2002, or actually 2001, uh, and the low set uh, in 2008. All right, that range has stood uh, before it and after it for 31 years. We're at the midpoint, which is approximately 95.75, 95.70, uh, and it's it, ha it holds some degree of technical influence, but generally the market is not as enthusiastic about uh, breaking it and producing follow-through. 2017 has been a bear trend for the dollar. It just hasn't been 
particularly consistent. We were measuring out the time in which we were actually marking new progress, new lows to this period. Uh, it doesn't really tally up to more than half the, the trading days. So it's a lack of momentum and a lack of conviction. And seeing this support, it should tell us, given the backdrop of these market conditions, and I'm saying this because we can do we can apply this to all currencies, all markets that we are uh, an analyzing. But I see this resistance, or sorry, support, uh, measuring the fundamentals, dubious influence uh, themselves, uh, and then I put against the market conditions, and it is less likely that I actually have a productive break. So rather than awaiting these massive anti-dollar breaks. Uh, whether it be Euro USD to the upside, Aussie USD to the upside, those are two currencies we're going to look at in a second, or pairs we're going to look at. I should instead look for measured moves if there's going to be attempted at a break, and if it starts to reverse, uh, perhaps that's easier to achieve when it happens with dollar support in these pairings. So, what were we looking at against this backdrop? Chairwoman Janet Yellen was doing her second day of testimony, not her first, and she is very practiced at walking a that, that uh, very thin line of not doing anything to inspire speculative ap appetites, uh, and she already uh, navigated the first day with little impact whatsoever. We had a decline, but certainly no serious progress, and it would it should strike no one as surprising that she didn't uh, offer anything different than the first day. Now, the Fed speakers uh, that were not the chairwoman uh, on the day were a little bit more noteworthy. Uh, Bernard, who have I said before is one of the most dovish members of the Fed, uh, she would suggest that uh, she really doesn't support rate hikes, and so did Kaplan, uh, the other speaker. Um, but both suggested that progress towards normalization is necessary. Uh, Kaplan saying balance sheet adjustment later this year, uh, and Bernard just being a little bit more vague. Uh, but we also have a couple of their issues, uh, like the suggestion by Bernard, that the asset values in the market are a little stretched. That's, that's really what I uh, think is going to be far more important going forward. Um, the reality of monetary policy, not as it relates to uh, the U.S. All right, we're not looking at the advantage or disadvantage to the U.S. Instead, what we're going to look increasingly towards is the concerns about uh, markets and the influence that monetary policy has had. We've we've talked about this on a very regular basis. How much conviction uh, has been built up into assets. This is the S&P 500 in the blue and the major central bank's balance sheet collectively in dollars actually trillions of dollars, um, between the U.S., the European, the Bank of England, the Chinese and Japanese central banks, all of these collectively going into this. And we know that this has had a profound influence on speculative reach. Uh, more so, not because of confidence building, but necessity, because it drives yields or rates of return lower. So to compensate, you need more capital gains to, to make up for the lack of income or yield or dividend. So, to say that these markets are a bit stretched is really uh, underserving the situation. But also, she, uh, Bernard, that is, uh, would suggest that uh, the markets don't have much of a, or central banks don't have much of a buffer. Uh, as it seems from her view that this is uh, an unfortunate reality that they have no influence over because she suggested that uh, the neutral rate is going to be, the natural neutral rate is going to be lower. Uh, meaning once they cap off on rates that are appropriate for conditions, that uh, it's probably going to be very low. And subsequently, if there's another crisis, she, the, the group itself cannot cut rates very deep to offset or, or to respond to that. Well, uh, that's not a very good position to be in, and it's a reality that ha should have been appreciated, I think, a little bit earlier in the planning phase. But we're now, what, eight years into recovery, and it's probably a little bit too late. And this is a concern that we need to watch and monitor very, very closely on a global basis, because we are starting to see the central banks turn towards hawkish, uh, with a stop in neutral territory, from an extremely accommodative, a very deep hole in, in balance sheet. 
Uh, the ECB and BOGA are next week. That's going to be very interesting. But the Bank of England looks like it's uh, close to me uh, considering a hike. The Bank of Canada's hiked this past week, which surprised me again. Um, and the RBNB, RBNZ are no doubt watching what the Bank of Canada has done and, so, and thinking maybe it's about time for them to do the same. So collectively, monetary policy is going to start tightening. And we need to look at that connection between sentiment and monetary policy. Now, this is a, obviously a global uh, consideration and what uh, Bernard and others have said is very important but it's not an immediate market mover for the traditional reasons that we've been discussing in past years we talk about oh well the Fed is hiking other central banks are sticking with their QE programs dollar rallies other currencies fall that's not the dynamic that we look at anymore the first mover status for the US dollar is no longer uh, low-hanging fruit it's been it's been a, a considerably discounted all right, people have bid up the dollar to account for that. Now, to push it further, you need to give it further appeal, further value beyond just the modest amount of yield differential you have already. So the dollar doesn't have an easy path to start its recovery, but in these market conditions, which are very difficult to develop trends and major breaks, uh, extending this into a deeper reversal really is a, a commitment uh, an easier uh, move is to essentially trade back into a range, and after 2017 first half, that has been a consistent downtrend, it's easier to actually motivate a move back into the upside. Essentially, to move back into a range rather than commit to a break. We can see this uh, logic, a little, I think, a little bit more straightforward in the EURUSD. Two and a half year range, we're at the top end, although not the absolute top, the zone top of this range. It is easier to move back into this broad range than it is to just keep pushing it and eventually break above 117.50. Now, that's not to say that this has to happen into a range, but it is easier and probabilities uh, follow. And subsequently, probabilities are how we have to operate. So a milestone like a Euro USD break below 113.75 and then below 113 are good uh, to maintain, to at least have some quantitative uh, triggers or signals. But this is uh, certainly a stretched anti-dollar view on the Euro USD. Uh, for its slower pace, this too is a stretched anti-dollar view. Uh, now, a couple other interesting ones that have been far more dramatic recently. Uh, the dollar CAD was late to the game in terms of depreciating the US dollar, but as you can see, it's played catch up very quickly with an 1100 point run in a little over two months. That's a massive, massive move. Uh, if you're talking about stretched and the dollar's due for a bounce, wouldn't you expect the bounce to be a little bit more aggressive uh, for a currency pair where it has seen this uh, level of intensity recently? All right, just something to take in consideration. Uh, but we also have this for the likes of the dollar yen. Unfortunately, the dollar has not really depreciated, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of depreciation that it can make up. All right, you're not reversing course hard on an anti-dollar view since the dollar is actually doing quite well over the past month. Uh, we also have the same kind of consideration uh, for the Aussie USD. All right, the anti-dollar view has been uneven, but this too has been a very aggressive recently. This is more a product of the Aussie dollar than it is the US dollar, but that is a tentative break. We'll talk about this in a second, but again, apply the first level assessment are these markets really conducive to break and, more importantly, trend? Because this is a very, very uh, uh, appealing, alluring situation. But we got to uh, think, is it, is it feasible? Is it reasonable to actually expect that to be a break to the upside with considerable fall through? And the Kiwi dollar uh, suggesting much the same. Again, a, a little bit more truncated, like the dollar CAD, a lot of the uh, anti-dollar move has come recently, just recently, uh, but it has been pretty intense. All right, now, heading into tomorrow's session, with this being considered, monetary policy losing some of its effectiveness as a direct catapult or catalyst for the U.S. dollar, more of a systemic view, the market conditions such as they are, difficult to really produce major breakouts. Yes, we can break technical boundaries, but... I'm talking about tradable breaks, breaks that not just have the technical close above or below a certain level, but also the capacity for follow through. Because we make our we make our profit on the follow through, not the break itself. This is not a right wrong situation. This is how much can I capture thereafter. 
So with those considerations in place, the U.S. docket is quite busy, uh, but put in context. U.S. CPI, very important for monetary policy. Uh, most of the doves amongst the Fed rank suggest that they are most concerned about inflation and how it's lacking. And if there were inflation to be picking up, uh, they would perhaps be a little bit more accommodative of uh, rate hikes in 2017, the second half of 2017, and probably move up the balance sheet adjustment, which they're generally favorable for. Good, but uh, the market hasn't really cast too much confidence in interest rate speculation. Hence the dollar not doing particularly well. And when you look at uh, uh, rate forecast through Fed funds futures, not really uh, picking uh, any significant uh, direction beyond the 50-50 that continues to uh, kind of flounder uh, this uh, rate forecasting through the end of the year. For the same purpose, Kaplan's rhetoric is probably not going to be very market moving. I don't know if his discussion this past session was a, a move up of what was planned for Friday, but um, if he does speak again, it's probably not going to give any more insightful view from uh, this policy official. Now, in contrast, getting away from one of a few themes. All right, The monetary policy is one theme, uh, but there are a couple other themes that uh, have the potential for moving the market. And including those themes is uh, risk trends, generally speaking, although that usually involves a catalyst, uh, geopolitical issues, which in politics this week have been pretty big and pretty boisterous, uh, but inconsistent in terms of uh, moving the markets. Uh, but generally an appreciation of the stretched nature of these markets, I think, is uh, increasingly a uh, reality that people are adjusting to, hence why we have the the remarks even from Lal Bernard that uh, asset value is a bit stretched. Um, so with that being said, what do the consumers in the world's largest economy, which also have uh, support the world's largest market uh, and collectively the largest um, net uh, investable assets amongst the populace, uh, a consumer populace as well as uh, average per person, the United States consumer confidence figures for the, from the University of Michigan are going to be very important to establishing how confident are we. And it can bring us back to those political issues. It can tell us that if confidence is dropping, which this series has been doing very well, so has the conference board's figures, uh, if this continues to drop, it is uh, by nature going to suggest that we're losing some confidence that the government policies that have been promised by the Trump administration, uh, like the infrastructure spending, the tax reforms, and the financial rollback, less the financial rollback for the consumer. That's more of a market thing. Uh, but those are growth friendly and revenue friendly and wage friendly. If confidence in those starts to, starts to flag, it's going to allow for consumer confidence to drop. And it can bring back that concern, which is still in the market. It's just not front of mind. So that's going to be one of the major considerations that we have to take into cons uh, that we have to account for uh, going forward for the dollar. All right. Now, this is very similar to what we need to look for on the risk front. Looking at risk trends, uh, we are in kind of the opposite position as what the dollar is looking at. It is facing a possible break to the upside. And like some of the dollar pairs, uh, there are certain risk-oriented assets that have already made the breaks and that are much shorter uh, to the uh, benchmark for the breakout. And then you have the likes of the S&P 500, which are right there, kind of like the dollars right there on support. The S&P 500 is a very good uh, uh, stand-in for sentiment in general. The S&P 500 is just shy of a record high. Uh, you have the VIX, which just winningly uh, dropped back below 10. Uh, it's been too long since we've had a, a reading below 10. Uh, this is, just to put it into context, these are extremely low volatility levels, extremely low. We cannot forget how remarkably quiet this is. And not necessarily bad. I've seen good arguments for why volatility can and should be low in certain periods. This is not one of those periods. All right? and growth does not justify it. The middle of a market phase does not justify it. We're at the very end, long in the tooth, and uh, really overvalued. Um, and the prevalence of risks around the system, not just US-based risks, but global risks, it, it does not justify a, a sub-10 VIX. 
and this is going to be something that eventually rectifies itself, but for now, uh, it supports that uh, risk lean, this risk positive lean. Uh, high yield fixed income, which we've been tracking back in its range. The emerging markets, though, just trying to really champion a rally. Uh, and uh, you don't really appreciate this technical pattern unless you go up to actually a monthly chart, but that was a major break of a wedge. Is this going to be one of the few that can defy the restraint of so, uh, so many other risk-oriented assets? I would very much doubt it. So keep a close eye on this, and you don't have to just look at the EEM, which is an ETF. You can also look at the likes of, you know, the 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 peso, or you might look at uh, the dollar czar, or any other uh, round of emerging market-related currency or specific. Uh, uh, indices or ETFs, sectors, uh, or the like. And speaking of emerging markets, I mean, one doing exceptionally well as well is the, this is the FXI, this is the Chinese uh, large cap ETF. Now, there are some additional factors to China. Uh, it's really some some positive data, although there's always a, a shroud of uh, skepticism around that data. Uh, but it's been positive so far this week, the trade figures this past session, uh, and GDP figures, uh, second quarter GDP is going to be due next week. We'll talk more about that for the weekend video. Uh, but this has been really extending a rebound, although to, to be uh, apples to apples in terms of comparison, the Chinese market really is starting at a much lower situation, a weekly chart as you see here. All right, now ahead, we need to think about the monetary policy considerations that we were talking about, specifically with the U.S., but this is very important from uh, the bigger picture perspective. We need to see how that monetary policy, as it collectively starts to move away from the extremely dovish and accommodative and uh, could potentially lift volatility and subsequently pull back on risk trends, when will this reality dawn? When will the, uh, the confidence shift? It's not clear. This is not going to be uh, a flip of the switch. It's going to be a re recognition that people come to at different times, but we need to be mindful that this is almost certainly going to come eventually. Uh, but we should also be looking for those po uh, political issues, uh, not just uh, in the U.S. and whether uh, uh, Trump administration uh, officials uh, have been uh, involved in collusion, which is uh, a constant in the headlines now. And yes, it can have dramatic impact as the bombastic titles have generated some volatility for the likes of the S&P 500, but also look at the the more structural geopolitical issues, like the relationships between European countries. Uh, this past session, actually, the French and German leaders uh, met and uh, agreed to greater collaboration, which is a positive, but the U.S. and its protectionist shift is a big potential uh, bifurcation, a, a, a crevasse uh, in, in capital uh, transmission around the world, and that's risk aversion. So keep an eye on that, but if you want more of the traditional uh, risk uh, motivators. Keep an eye on bank earnings from the United States for the second quarter. Citibank, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo all due before the open, U.S. session open. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. Uh, I see the the roaring confidence in the figures on a regular basis, and this has been the case for years, not just for the banking sector, but you have to th consider that a lot of the times these analyst forecasts that we beat have been lowered. They are lower than previous quarter. That to meet to beat these expectations, which I'm not a big fan of GAAP, uh, but to beat these expectations, we also have to see a drop in bottom line uh, and top line figures. Uh, so cutting costs to offset the drop in revenues. Look at the underlying structure. Don't just go by the headlines. They're really not that encouraging. It's much like the same uh, consideration and chart that we see here. Just like yield drops for the broader market, based on the 10-year G10 government bond yields, uh, so too do revenues drop and uh, returns drop for corporations and investors. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it would be, at this point, it's, it's frankly shocking when they when they do miss forecasts. Uh, so another consideration for instance, I don't think it's necessarily going to have a lot of run unless it is a collective disappointment. 
All right, now outside of the risk and monetary policy, which the dollar is going to be a very big champion of, there's some, been some pretty remarkable moves uh, from a couple key players uh, that haven't been at the top of my list. The Canadian dollar, though, uh, that was really the big driver with the Bank of Canada rate hike. Uh, we had all that movement, movement in Wednesday and Thursday we struggle for follow through and that's remarkable here for the dollar cat which is kind of out in, in no man's land after the big break uh, but I think it's even more interesting for the likes of the Kiwi CAD which attempted a break I reduced the intensity of this line but it, it made that break that technical break one two three points on a trend line so that stood uh, but the breakdown was completely undermined in terms of conviction with Thursday session when we had a big rally mainly due to the Kiwi which we'll look at in a second um, and it uh, negates momentum and it also questions the uh, accuracy and the influence of that trend line that we just cleared. All right, so we will reduce the intensity of that line. Uh, so we do have more support levels down here but this calls into question just like we've been talking about in other markets uh, how much break and follow through potential you actually can have regardless of where it's at. I mean, we're talking about risk trends and uh, dollar-based pairs which have so many complications. KiwiCAD doesn't have those complications. Yes, it has things that differentiate the value between the two currencies, but it's not sitting around waiting for big picture things. This should be more clear to run, but it's, re it's really indicative of the conditions that we have to deal with. And arguably the most interesting of the CAD based crosses, and they all look generally interesting, but the CAD yen. All right. If you look at the CAD yen on a weekly chart, you get an appreciation of the inverse head and shoulders pattern, shoulder, head, shoulder, neckline, and that is a very large technical pattern. We are attempting to break that neckline, but where is the, where is the amplitude? Where is the excitement? Where is the speculative capital inflow when you clear in a technical level? In these kind of conditions, technicals lose some of their ability to move the markets. All right. Keep an eye on this because this is still uh, an opportunity, but uh, we have to gauge it against what we actually can expect. Now, two other currencies that I thought were far more remarkable for their movements uh, recently are the Aussie and the Kiwi. Now, I showed you the Aussie USD. Uh, that actually has cleared a trend line that you see here. So the general general weakness of the U.S. dollar certainly contributed to this, but the Aussie dollar had a very strong performance this past session. This is a technical break, although we come into a zone of resistance we can potentially face uh, between about 77.40 and 77.75. But uh, we can see this also played through on the Aussie CAD. All right, the Aussie dollar offsetting some of the Canadian dollar's strength on Wednesday, offsetting it for Thursday. Uh, actually, on a shorter time frame chart, creating some very interesting technical patterns. Uh, the Euro Aussie. All right, very strong two-day rally here from the Aussie dollar. The Pound Aussie. All right, more measured, but still great strength. Uh, and the Aussie uh, Yen. Attempting to break a descending trend line. Three points, one, two, three. Clearing it, that is a technical break. But how much follow through should we be expecting? There's actually a, a collection of fibs here. 61.8 61, fib uh, from back here, 2007 high down to 2008 low, uh, as well as the midpoint for this range, all collectively at 87.60 or 87.65, which we're currently at. So you have to question is there follow through here? This Aussie dollar, I mean, if you look for justification or motivation, uh, it certainly could draw from a um, stronger than expected Australian consumer inflation expectations figure, which may motivate the Australian central bank to do what the Bank of Canada did, hike rates in the foreseeable future. Uh, but when do we see that verified? Uh, is it reasonable? I and mean, what has it been able to accomplish for the Canadian dollar beyond that Wednesday move? So is the Aussie dollar any different with less conviction or less uh, evidence that this is actually happening? The same is true of the Kiwi dollar, although the Kiwi dollar's move was less intense. Uh, the Kiwi dollar did rally. It didn't uh, mark a clear break of the Kiwi USD pairing. All right, so we're generally up against some very strong resistance, like the Aussie USD. If you're 
if you're essentially uh, in U.S. dollar bullish, you think it's, uh, it's overdone, it's going to bounce. These are two currency crosses I'd watch very closely, Aussie USD and Kiwi USD. But some of the other uh, Kiwi-based crosses uh, that were quite interesting, we already uh, talked about the Kiwi CAD, which undermined this, and 92 might be the support now, um, and the Kiwi Yen. Similar to the Aussie Yen, but this didn't have the sloping trend line resistance. This has a general range top uh, or zone uh, just shy of uh, 84, 80 um, in the zone top. But we are tr currently trading in that zone. And if we go down to a four hour chart, you can see uh, we should watch these uh, levels. Noteworthy that we have a expanding wedge, which is unusual, but uh, indicative of increased volatility and possible break. Uh, easier to achieve a break to the downside. It's a move back into a range, path least resistance, and you might be able to, to squeeze out more mo movement from that. But we'll see if that actually happens. As for the commodities market, the gold uh, lack of conviction continues. Some short-term volatility is likely, given that we are uh, moving into a tighter range. This often happens with gold, uh, but I wouldn't expect much of a follow through. Same is true of the uh, silver, which I'm watching a little bit more closely, especially given the recent volatility that has uh, certainly outpaced its gold counterpart. Uh, and oil has not uh, given us any greater conviction. Inventories figures the other day didn't provide much of a motivation for a rally. Uh, OPEC headlines have softened a bit. Uh, this is now starting to talk about uh, uh, the general long-term glut, which that, that's definitely evidence that it's lost a lot of its volatility. Uh, in the cryptocurrency world, Bitcoin uh, has stabilized. Uh, we're around uh, 2400 to 2250 in the general range, uh, waiting for speculators to take the next cause up. Uh, watch the headlines day to day, but generally this is a speculative asset. It will be motivated by speculative uh, motivations, and often that's just animal spirits. ETH, Ethereum, all right, a little bit more volatility here. Uh, its intensity is attractive to many people who are just seeking out volatility. And if you look on a four hour chart, yes, you, you have some cleaner technicals. But remember, this is a speculative motivated asset. This is not a treasury, so don't treat it as such. All right, it's not an absolute safe haven. This is going to move. And yes, you can you can generally expect a lot of losses as much as you can expect significant gains. Volatility and leverage can do that to you. And just to remind you that this is a speculative asset, in the United States, the IRS requires you to report that any gains you make on cryptocurrency is uh, taxed at a capital gains rate. All right, so even the IRS thinks it's a, it's a speculative asset. All right. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our final rundown of the week and the, more importantly, an outlook for next week with uh, Chinese GDP, the ECB, and BOJ rate decisions tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.